All right. Well, hello, and um, welcome back from the break. Uh, my name is Issa Davis, and I'm an associate professor of medicine, clinical, and translational uh, science at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I am very excited and uh, very honored to be moderating this second session of the workshop. So over the next hour, we're going to hear about recommendations for uh, beverage intake that's applicable to young children. Um, we will first hear from Dr. Rafael Perez Escamilla from the Yale School of Public Health, who will be discussing um, from the Dietary Guidelines Advi uh, Advisory Committee. And then we will hear from Dr. Uh, Stephen Daniels of the University of Colorado School of Medicine, who will discuss the recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and so this session will um, follow the previous uh, session in terms of its format. We're going to first hear from our speakers, and then I will bring them up, and we'll have a facilitated discussion. Um, so please remember to fill out your uh, index cards and um, pass them um, to the end of the aisles for collection. And so with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Perez Escamilla. Thank you so much, uh, Isa, for your kind introduction, and I deeply want to thank the organizing committee for the honor of this invitation. So I will focus mostly my remarks on relevant topics, recommendations, implication statements that were made by the 2015 DJC with regards to sugar-sweetened beverages uh, and, to some extent, water. Uh, this work uh, really uh, represents a major, major effort uh, of over two years by a distinguished uh, interdisciplinary committee that uh, Ana Maria Siega Riz, Mary Story, and myself were here, had the honor and privilege to have been a part of. Uh, as this audience knows very, very well, uh, the DGAs are very much influenced by the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee uh, report, and the DGAs in turn have an enormous impact on all food and nutrition policy in the country, especially at the federal level with very strong permeation to the state all the way to the local level. And we also know that the recommendations made by the DGAs have a huge impact on product formulation or reformulation by the food industry in the policies for nutrition education as part of food assistance programs as well. But perhaps what I need to highlight uh, right away is that the Dietary Guidelines for Americans still now, they still don't address the children between birth and two years of age. So it is impossible for me to make any statements about that age group, but Steve, who will follow me, will do a fantastic job uh, doing that. So just to remind you, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee report uh, was based in very, very strong uh, evidence-based consensus uh, committee format and involved original systematic reviews, review of expert reports, as well as food pattern modeling, especially from the What We Eat in America survey, and we commissioned additional specific data analysis. Uh, this topic, of course, uh, was of utmost interest for the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee because it falls squarely within the major childhood obesity epidemic that the country is facing. About one in five preschool children are overweight or obese, and there was growing evidence at the time that preschoolers who were overweight or obese experienced already negative physical consequences at that young age. They didn't need to wait much longer to start uh, manifesting uh, a, a number of cardiometabolic uh, abnormalities. And also, the need for effective efforts to prevent excessive gain for this group were fully recognized since the very beginning. Our committee defined sugar-sweetened beverages as liquids that are sweetened with various forms of added sugars. And SSBs include, but were not limited to, soda, fruitates, and sport drinks. 
So it is uh, very important uh, to know since the beginning of my presentation that if there was a, a food group uh, or a, a category of uh, food and beverages products that moderately or strongly were related to all sorts of negative health outcomes were sugar sweetened foods and beverages. And this applied mostly, as Ana Maria mentioned before, to studies that have been carried out with adults, some with adolescents, but almost none uh, with children. So you have to be aware of that. But the outcomes we're talking about are obesity, uh, dental caries, and chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. So there was a strong evidence uh, to indicate that the intake of added sugars uh, from foods and or sugar sweetened beverages are associated with excess body weight in children and adults, that the reduction of added sugars and sugar sweetened beverages in the diet uh, reduces body mass index in both groups as well. And when we compare the highest versus the lowest intake of added sugar groups in cohort studies, uh, this, uh, co the committee concluded that it was important to keep added sugars intake below 10% of total energy intake, which is a point I will go back to uh, in a few more slides. Also, uh, oftentimes we don't think about oral health as part of nutrition, and I just think that's probably driven by the insurance companies that they don't cover uh, oral health. I don't know why that is, but, but there is no doubt, and we concurred with the World Health uh, Organization, that there is a relationship between the amount of the so-called free sugars and the development of dental caries among children and adults. And the dental caries are lower when free sugar intake is less than 10% of energy intake. And this was a moderate level of evidence. Now, a very important, uh, relatively new approach that our committee took was, you know, let's not focus so much on individual nutrients or individual foods or even individual food groups, but rather let's be realistic and think about the fact that people follow dietary patterns that include beverages. So that's why we took on the challenge of assessing the total diet. And very briefly, uh, we know, uh, as I mentioned, that children under two are not addressed by the dietary guidelines uh, for Americans, but the DGAC was able to break down a number of food groups that are key components of healthy dietary patterns to try to see how the U.S. population is doing uh, by age group. And when it comes to total vegetables, we can see that it's a disaster. I mean, this, the, the great, great majority are below the recommendation. It doesn't matter if you are a toddler or if you are an older adult or anything in between. When it comes to whole grains, you know, this really speaks volumes about the need to rethink, for example, the recommendations regarding fruit juice intake vis-a-vis -vis whole fruits. I mean, with regards to fiber, if we don't consume enough fruits, enough vegetables, enough uh, whole grains, uh, they're just not, we're just not going to be able, any age group is not going to be able to meet the recommendations. Excessive amounts of sodium, uh, right and left across age groups, and empty calorie consumption also way above what we would consider the upper tolerable limits. And these are foods that are very rich in solid fats and added sugars and have very low uh, nutrient, nutrient density. So when it came to the total diet, uh, perhaps uh, one of the key findings, most important findings for uh, children and youth was that the dietary pattern systematic reviews it found that uh, diet patterns higher in energy dense and low fiber foods such as sweets, refined grains, and processed meats, as well as sugar sweetened beverages. Whole milk, fried potatoes, certain fats and oils, and fast foods increase the risk of obesity uh, later on in life. And I do want to point out the fact that sugar sweetened beverages is one of the elements that were identified as part of, of this uh, un unhealthy uh, dietary, uh, dietary patterns. Now the evidence here is limited mostly for the reasons mentioned that by Ana Maria that there are very, very few studies that have started in childhood, especially cohort studies. 
So that is an area that we did what we could with the cards that we had available to, to play here. So the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee also included a three cross-cutting working groups addressing um, nutrients of concern in excess, sodium, saturated fat, and other sugars. And given the topic today, I will just focus on the conclusion from that analysis with regards to added sugars. So the most important one that is expected or we expected and has already had a major impact on rethinking food labels in the country was to limit added sugars to no more than 10% of uh, daily calories. And we carefully and strongly stated that added sugar should be replaced uh, in the diet by selecting healthier options uh, rather than replacing them with low calorie sweeteners. Although we did look at the safety of aspartame, we had no reason in adults uh, to be worried about aspartame with the levels of consumption. There was absolutely no reason for us to endorse the use of, of a calorie, low calorie sweeteners for, uh, for children. So the recommendation to limit added sugars to a maximum of 10% of total daily caloric intake really was a triage of different sources of evidence. So the food pattern modeling analysis, uh, which I will share in a moment, and also the scientific uh, uh, evidence review on added sugars and chronic disease, they very much consistently stated that it's not a good idea for human beings to consume more than 10% of their daily calories from added sugars. And when it looks to the modeling, really it's very clear that it is very difficult to achieve a helpful food pattern when added sugars in foods and beverages are consumed uh, above 10%. And uh, I want you to focus your attention to the bottom lower half of this table where we really have the percent of calories that are left uh, to play around with if we wanted to be a little bit lenient with added sugars uh, in terms of energy left that could be used for that in the diet uh, after being able to feed one of three healthy dietary patterns that were modeled by our committee. And as you can see, we were in fact a little bit generous because we could have easily gone for uh, no more than 5% of total calories from from added sugars. And even though this is not broken down by age group, it is broken down by the daily caloric requirement, which pretty much correlates well with age, age as well. So we went the 10%, but clearly uh, others have gone to the 5% level, like the World Health Organization. And they do have also the evidence, the scientific evidence to, to uh, to support that recommendation. So the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee recommendation uh, was preceded or has been followed by very similar recommendations across very prestigious uh, pediatric and uh, international health organizations and also the American Heart Organization, the CDC, and the American Diabetes Association. So the level of scientific consensus here is very, very strong, and that's why I think it has had the impact on rethinking food label policy in the country the way it has had. So in, in the implication of uh, the dietary patterns work is that the U.S. population should be encouraged and guided to consume dietary patterns that are rich in vegetables, fruit, whole grain, seafood, legumes, and nuts, and seeds, and moderate in low and non-dairy fat products and alcohol, if obviously thinking about adults, the alcohol, lower in red and processed meat, and low, again, in sugar, sweetened food, and beverages, and refined grains. And you can see that the implication statement about uh, sugar, sweetened uh, foods and beverages is embedded as part of the total diet of a dietary pattern statement because it is not just one food or one food product that will change dramatically uh, the risks. So these data, you know, are for the target population for the dietary guidelines for Americans, which is everybody between two and 
uh, you know, the end uh, almost, uh, and, and the older adult period. And essentially what it is communicating, which is quite remarkable to see how these patterns get established so early on in life, is that uh, uh, sugar-sweetened uh, beverages, uh, as well as uh, fruit and fruit juice and snack and sweets, explain a very high percent of the energy sources in the US, the US diet. Lots and lots and lots of sugar. Mixed dishes, snacks and sweets, and beverages together contribute to almost 60% of energy intake in the US population. And beverages contribute 19% of total energy intake. And the major source of the beverages are sugar sweetened beverages, milk and milk drinks, and 100% uh, fruit juices. So uh, here we're talking about the whole population. It totally justifies the family approach that has been endorsed uh, already. And when we look at the food sources of added sugars uh, as a, in terms of by food category, we can see that sugar sweetened beverages explain 39% of the added sugars. So also, also this was very easy to state that dramatically reducing the intake of sugar sweetened beverages and limiting sweets and desserts would help lower intakes, uh, the food component of added sugars, if that was a policy that the government wanted to pursue. So speaking about policy, uh, since its inception, we actually develop a social ecological type of model to think about not only uh, making evidence-based nutrition guidelines recommendations, but also to look at evidence-based policies that may be likely to help improve the diet of all Americans. So when it comes to this age group, as Steve mentioned earlier, I do have to get a little bit into school policies, otherwise I wouldn't have much to say about policy implications from the dietary guidelines uh, among very, very young kids. So uh, essentially, there is very strong evidence that implementing school policies for nutrition standards to improve the availability, accessibility, and consumption of healthy foods and beverages sold outside the school meal programs and reducing or eliminating unhealthy foods and beverages can help improve purchasing behavior and higher quality dietary intake by children while at school. So there is evidence of that. There is also plenty of evidence that it is really, really hard to be able to eat healthy if you eat outside the home, if you don't have access to restaurants that tend to be very expensive where you can actually have your salads and your water and everything the way uh, the way the way you want. When it comes to policy implementation, the nutrition facts label was a very important area of focus for us. I myself have done extensive research and some randomized control trials on the importance of using nutrition facts labels, for example, for individuals with type 2 diabetes to help improve their blood glucose control, and these are very low-income Hispanics in Connecticut with whom I have been uh, working. So we specifically recommended for the nutrition facts label to include added sugars in a very clear way and in different ways for everybody to be able to understand to assist the consumers in really identify the total amount of carbohydrates, added sugars, and, and so on. And we felt uh, also that there was enough evidence through the wonderful IOM report that was available to us on the potential benefit from a standardized, very colorful, user-friendly, easy-to-follow front-of-package uh, label. So we, ha we also identified specific tools. We also identified early care and education uh, settings as being extremely important in addition to schools for implementing policies to limit sugar sweetened beverages and to empower through nutrition curricula the teachers and the providers with the ability to implement, uh, implement those, uh, those policies. And so to also to implement a comprehensive school uh, meal guidelines, again, if we're going to reduce sugar sweetened beverages, we probably would like to increase intake of vegetables and fruits and whole grains and to limit access to foods that are very high in the nutrients that are of concern in excess, the limiting of marketing of unhealthy food to children. And my colleague from California is going to be very happy that we also made a recommendation of uh, making drinking water freely available to students throughout the day, no matter where, where they are. And in fact, the need to eliminate sugar-sweetened beverages 
they are not needed, and the evidence is very strong of the harm that they can cause. So water is a preferred, plain water is a preferred uh, beverage uh, choice for the reasons that were stated uh, by, the, by the panel before. And of course, the challenge is to provide free and safe water for all the children across settings. And obviously, that they should have access to that healthy tap water at home as well. With regards to, fe to federal food assistance programs, uh, we specifically mentioned SNAP and the WIC programs as very influential federal food assistance programs that perhaps should consider better approaches to foster the consumption of healthier food options and disincentivate the consumption of unhealthy uh, sugar sweetened foods and beverages and, uh, and other types of, of unhealthy, unhealthy foods. It, the WIC program has done a fabulous job in redesigning the packages. We've done it for a second time very recently, and it, that's the direction that the WIC program has taken. So I very much concur that the WIC program may be playing a role in the decline of not only sugar sweetened beverages, but fruit juice consumption in the country. Remember that that program serves uh, over half of all the babies born in our country. Obviously, pilot studies were underway. The HIP trials were underway when we were doing the guidelines, but more are needed to better understand how to notch uh, towards a healthier food and beverage consumption, the families, the children, and so on. And good pilot randomized trials using different incentives uh, and or restrictive earmarking type of measures are we believe they were they were warranted. Uh, I really loved, uh, you know, uh, how nicely the statements that were done about sugar sweetened beverages uh, taxes uh, were made this morning. Because when we proposed these, you know, we had a lot of people screaming at us that we were not evidence based, that this was the worst possible idea ever, ever, ever invented in the world, and that this would never be implementable. There was emerging data then. Uh, the the Bloomberg uh, philanthropies were very engaged already in Mexico, planning for the Mexico tax. So we took the brave step of saying yes, there is some evidence and there is more coming. So it, this should be considered. Uh, as, as a policy. Mexico is in its second year and with very, very high quality publications in uh, BMJ, in PLOS One, very recent in health affairs. After two years, uh, there is still plenty of evidence that the consumption of soda per capita in Mexico continues to go down through time series analysis, very, very likely as a result of the implementation of the tax that was not only for sugar sweetened beverages, but once the government saw the amount of money it generated, they also put it into junk food, even though nobody asked them to put the tax in junk food. So, so policymakers are very much buying uh, this, this idea, quite into this idea very nicely. Obviously, there are other alternatives based on price incentives and really, you know, what drives the farm bill policies and the pricing of agricultural commodities that goes a long way towards increasing the likelihood that especially low-income families can really have the ability to implement the guidelines that we are, that we are recommending. I'm not going to say a lot about responsible marketing because there are big experts in this room and there's probably going to be a whole presentation right uh, later on. But the DJC did identify this as a very, very important uh, topic to, uh, to address, especially to protect children and adolescents against very, very irresponsible uh, marketing and ethnic racial targeting by the, uh, by the food industry. 280 million in promotion for healthy foods in 2009 versus $1.7 billion in promotion for unhealthy foods uh, to kids in the same year. Over 2 billion ads for foods and drinks in websites targeting kids in 2009. And the level of advertising in non-traditional media, all the for my age, non-traditional, sorry for the millennials in the room, but, but it has increased dramatically uh, through social media, the level of advertisement. And please uh, pay attention to those spoonfuls of sugar because this is what is being advertised uh, to the kids. 80% of foods and drinks advertised to kids on Spanish television are unhealthy. Uh, and black kids see more than twice as many TV ads for sugary drinks as white kids do. And 
With regards to the question about the black kids earlier on, I wonder how much uh, this is the result uh, of that. And last but not least, you know, we know that the Healthy Eating Research uh, Initiative funded by the Robert, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has been convening uh, panels for some years now to come, on, to come up with very, very meaningful uh, public health translation of dietary guidance for you know, the US population. And one of the uh, guidelines that they focus on were uh, sugar sweetened beverages and beverages in general. And very importantly, they identify as healthier beverage recommendations for preschool children and school age kids, water, milk, and juice. And obviously, you know, they are placing the very strong warning about juice consumption and the limits and the fact that it may not be. A, needed if, if uh, the, the kids don't want to consume it and they want to eat fruit, uh, fruit instead. And they went on to make recommendations for adolescents as well, but um, I think uh, I will not have time to get more into it. I'm not saying anything about milk because that would be uh, another talk, but obviously that is a very healthy beverage for kids that can be fitted very well as part of a healthy dietary patterns. So in conclusion, foods and beverages with other sugars contribute to excessive caloric intake and increase the risk of poor uh, health outcomes. The 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee included evidence-based policy recommendations to reduce uh, sugar sweetened beverages and increase water consumption. We specifically focus on food labels, on interventions for schools, easy settings, food assistance programs, tax price incentives, and marketing practices. As it was mentioned this morning, prospective cost effectiveness research is needed, and implementation policy research based on uh, systems frameworks is very much needed. I have a paper in press that I'll be happy to share with any of you who want to learn how Latin America has been successful at implementing food label legislation, sugar sweetened and junk food uh, taxes, and food product uh, reformulation. There's a lot that we can learn from other countries as well. Thank you very much.